Malachi chapter 2. If you would turn there in your Bibles, you can find it also in the bulletin uh, at the top of page 6. As I mentioned, this is a a passage, nine verses here, about uh, the priesthood. If you'll remember so far, this is our third installment in our brief series here looking at this prophet. And um, most of the minor prophet books are about God coming to his people, and he's, he's frustrated, he's, he's, um, he's angered at their sin and their rebellion. And, and Malachi is, is not different, really, in that respect. Uh, and so what we find throughout this book is God laying the case for uh, why um, Israel has sinned and why they are therefore deserving of God's wrath. But he's also pleading with them to turn back to him and to repent. If you remember the first argument that God brings to them is that he is love, that he loves them, right? He, he doesn't begin his argument with the fact that he is, is um, powerful and can destroy them or that he is a judge and will condemn them or that he's holy and will consume them, although he is all those things and could do all those things. His opening argument to Israel to bring them to repentance is that he is love and that he will embrace them. And he gives them that message, and yet they're not turning back. So now he gets into more details. Okay, well, this is what you've done, and this is how you must turn back to me. And the first and a specific instance of sin that he calls out is the sin of worship, polluted worship. We saw that last week. Um, and now this week, that continues, that same argument. But he hones in even more specifically, not on the Israelites as a whole, but on the priests, the ones who have the job of leading in worship. So let's see that now here in the first, uh, first nine verses of Malachi chapter 2. And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found upon his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction." You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts, and so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. This is for the word of God to us this evening. Well, when things go wrong in life, when things go wrong for us, uh, everybody wants a fall guy, somebody to take the blame And the higher up you are in your various circles of life, the more responsibility to have, and the more likely it is that you will be the one taking the fall for others' mistakes. We have seen foremen get chewed out by their supervisors for the failings of their crew. We've seen CEOs have to step down because of their employees who consistently fail to meet certain standards and and have damaged the company's reputation. And so the bosses are the ones who, who have to take the fall for that. There's an infamous story of Lieutenant William Calley and the My Lai Massacre. This was in 1968 in Vietnam. And the My Lai Massacre, about 30 U.S. soldiers were involved in a brutal um, slaughter of over 500 uh, Vietnam citizens, not soldiers, citizens, uh, unarmed Vietnam civilians in the town of uh, My Lai. And Cali was a leader of one of the platoons, and he himself was responsible, uh, guilty, for killing 20 individuals, 20 of 500. However, the rule of law came down hardest on him. And as the leader of his people, as the leader of the platoon, he was the only one found guilty and sentenced, indeed, to life in prison. For those guilty soldiers, 
we see that their lieutenant became a fall guy for them. He took the brunt of really what should have been their punishment as well. Something similar is happening in the passage that we've read with the Israelites. They are guilty. They are just as guilty as the priests of profaning and polluting, and perverting worship, God's worship. But it is the priests, it is the priests who we see are given the responsibility uh, for leading the people, and therefore they have the harsher sentence come down upon them. At the end of last chapter, we saw, perhaps uncomfortably, that God calls out his people. He calls out us for improper worship. And so as we come to chapter 2, we might be tempted to take a sigh of relief, right? Because these words of condemnation, of curse, are going to the priests, right? We find here the first thing that we see this evening is that it's the priest's fault. That's the first thing, the priest's fault for the improper worship that is taking place, the polluted worship. It's the priest's fault. Everything wrong that had gone on now in the temple, every way in which worship had become twisted and perverted, God lays the guilt of all of that upon the shoulders of Israel's priests uh, because they are the divinely appointed worship leaders after all. And so God says there, look at verse 1 again. God says, this is for you, right? And now, O priests... This command, or that word command could be translated this ad, uh, admonition, this admonition is for you. The, the idea is this, uh, uh, in light of everything that was said at the end of chapter 1, God now says that this command, this strong word, this rebuke is directed at the priests. Verse 2, he says, If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, if you're not going to change, in other words, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you. You will be the ones who will be cursed. The priests, they need to change in order for the people to change. There needs to be a change in leadership. The people need strong, pure, devout leaders in the temple, in their worship services. And so God comes down so harshly upon the priests of Israel because he takes the sanctity of the entire nation seriously. He wants the entire people to be holy, but that needs to begin at the top. But there's another reason given for why God deals so sternly with the priesthood here. And in fact, it's the reason that this passage focuses on the most. It's the fact that the priests were bound to God by way of a covenant. They had this special relationship that they were to serve him faithfully. And God doesn't take that covenant, covenantal relationship lightly. That's hinted at there in verse 4. Look at verse 4 of chapter 2. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you that my covenant with Levi may stand. We could render it like this. In other words, God is saying the reason that I'm taking this so seriously and giving you this, repent, uh, this, this command to repent or to be cursed is so that you will know that I don't take my covenants lightly. God is hearkening back to a covenant that he entered into with Levi, apparently. Now, in this passage, when it refers to Levi, it's referring not to Levi the individual, the son of Jacob, but to the Levitical tribe, to the Levites, right? To the Levites. Levi himself wasn't that complimentary of a figure, but the tribe, his tribe, the, the, the descendants that came from him, eventually, hundreds of years later, they rose to prominence in, in the history of Israel, uh, in, in part, uh, or maybe primarily, because Moses and Aaron were from the tribe of Levi, and so there became this, they, they had this special status about them. Also, the Levites were the only people, this is really important, the only people at Mount Sinai, at that, that heartbreaking, tragic event of sin, when, God, uh, when Israel commits adultery on their wedding night, and Moses comes down the mountain Right after the ten, he receives the Ten Commandments, and what does he find? He finds Israel, they, they, they are uh, whoring after idols, right, with the golden calves. At that moment, the Levites, and only the Levites, prove themselves to be on God's side, to be on Moses' side. We read this in Exodus 32. Uh, Moses comes down and he says, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. 
And the only people who rally behind him are the Levites. And so Moses says, Exodus 32, verse 29, Today, you, the Levites, you have been ordained for the service of the Lord so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. You've been ordained. You've been set apart. And this is confirmed later in Deuteronomy chapter 10, which speaks of this event. That historical scene is filled out a little bit. Deuteronomy 10, verse 8, it says, At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to him, and to bless in his name. And so this is very likely the covenant that Malachi is referring to. When, when through the words of the Lord, uh, he writes that, that God entered into a covenant with Levi. He's, he's talking about how the Le- Levitical priests, the, they, they were set apart, ordained for service to, to minister to God and, and to the people, to bless in God's name. The covenantal relationship with the Levites and their Lord, we go on to read, could only be a good thing. When kept, that is, right? Verse 5. My covenant with him, with the Levites, it was one of life and peace. It's a good thing. And I gave this to him. And it was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. There was respect. He, 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 he was in awe of my name. This covenant with the Levites is a good thing. It can only be a good thing. It can only bring life and peace when it is kept. But the priests of Malachi's day had failed to live up to their responsibilities. Verses 6 through 8 show how these current priests have completely sullied the legacy of the Levites. He compares what, what the Levites used to be like. There was true instruction. They always spoke the truth and they walked before God with peace and uprightness of heart and And they turned many from iniquity. This is what a priest is meant to do, God says in verse 7. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction. Verse 8. But you have turned aside from the way, and you've caused many to stumble by your instruction. The priests have this solemn responsibility because they have a sacred relationship with God. Did you hear that? That, that's, That's the foundation of what... What, what, what this argument is all about, why God is coming to the priests. It's they, they have this, this severe responsibility, this strict responsibility because of their sacred relationship, because of the covenant. A solemn responsibility because of a sacred relationship, but they're no, act, no longer acting like it. And while the whole nation is guilty, God says here, it's the priest's fault. It's the priest's fault. And so the curse Is coming for them directly, right? Verse 2, again, if you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, then I will send the curse upon you. It's the priest's fault, and so they will be cursed. And like I said earlier, after last week's message convicting passage about the ways in which we profane God's worship in our own hearts, and there's strong language uh, where that passage reveals our sin and culpability in the manner of impure worship, maybe we want to take a, a, a huge sigh of relief to know that it's the priests who are taking the fall for us. You know, we can pass the, the buck off to them, as it were. But that's not how Israel would have heard this word from God. They would not have felt like they were in the clear. They would have been terrified, in fact, to hear this admonition against the priest. They would have been terrified. They would have wailed. They would have mourned. Because although God is making it clear that their predicament is the priest's fault, he is also making it abundantly clear that it's everybody's problem. That's the second and final thing to see tonight. Although it's the priest's fault, it's everybody's problem. We see that in a number of ways in this text. How their sin affects everybody. How this is not an issue that they can just pretend isn't a big deal. We see that in a number of of ways. We mentioned one already. When the priest fails in their duty, the people will not be taught and guided in the ways of God. And and they will not be able to approach him. Remember verse 8? Verse 8, what does it say? You have turned aside from the way and you've caused many to stumble by your 
instruction. The sins of the priests lead to the sins of the people. There's this correlation. And those sins, they themselves will be held accountable for. The people will be held accountable for the sins that they commit, even though they committed them because the priests did not lead them properly. But even more despairingly is this fact. When the priests are cursed, listen to this. This is the the most devastating aspect of this, this passage and what God is saying. When the priests are cursed, everybody's cursed. Did you note that? Did you, did, you, did you pick up on that in God's strong language to the priests? If you read between the lines there, you can see it. It's at the end of verse 2. If you don't take it to heart, then I will send the curse upon you. And then it says, and I will curse your blessings. Well, what was one of the main responsibilities of the priests? What was one of their main jobs? It was to bless to bless the people of God uh, in God's name, in God's place. They were representatives of God, and they would, they would bless the people. One of the primary functions was to bless God's people on God's behalf. Number six, right? Speak to Aaron and his sons, God says, Aaron the priest and his sons, saying, Thus shall you bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. God's saying, I will bless the people through the priests when they lift up their hands and they administer a blessing. I will actually be blessing the people. I will bless their blessings. But now God says, I will curse your blessings. That's not good news. God says this this can't happen anymore because when the priests are defiled, whatever comes from them is defiled. When they are cursed, anything that comes from them will be cursed. And so the priests can go ahead and they can go through the motions and they can go ahead and they can lift up their hands and they can say this ironic benediction and they they can stick to the script. It doesn't matter if they say the exact same words written here. God says, in effect, this is really what you will be pronouncing upon the people. The Lord curse you and forsake you. The Lord turn his face away from you. The Lord never look upon you again and give you hell. He's cursed even their blessings. And so this word against the priests of Israel is terrible news for the whole nation. Because the priest is the mediator. The priest is that go-between A go-between for sinful men and a holy God. The pronouncement of curse upon the priests is nothing other than a pronouncement of curse upon the entire nation. It means that they'll all be cut off from that life-giving supply, the presence of God. You look at verse 3, and we read strong language that says, Part of this curse upon the priesthood will be that they will be covered in dung, in excrement. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces. The dung of your offerings. This is interesting. So essentially what he's saying is, you know, if you read through those uh, passages in the book of Leviticus that give instructions for how you're to offer up uh, sacrifices, there are certain parts of the animal that were not to be offered to the Lord, the entrails and such. And, and, And God is saying, God is saying to the priests, when you try to go through the motions of offering a sacrifice, the, the parts of the animal that are unclean, I'm going to actually put on your face. And so even though you try to bring me an offering, it will be polluted. It will be impure. Those things that have, have, have no place in my worship, you're going to be covered in them. See, this isn't just a, a, a gross word. We're not just meant to think that this is disgusting. The point of this is that it means the priests are unclean and therefore they are unable to enter God's presence and therefore they are unable to actually fulfill their responsibility of of being priests, to fulfill their role as priests, which is to offer sacrifices, to make atonement for sin, to, to reconcile God and his people to one another. And so again, the whole nation is in dire straits. It's reminiscent of that famous scene in... Uh, Zechariah chapter 3, you remember when, when Joshua, the high priest, 
has this vision where he's brought before the very throne room of God and he's wearing garments that are covered in the same thing, excrement, filth, dung. And he's standing before the, the holy of holies and Satan is there accusing him because he is so disgusting. And that's bad news not just for Joshua who is before God's presence, it's bad news for, for all of Israel because he is representing them before God's presence. If he's filthy, they're filthy. They are there with him. They are before God just as filthy as he is. And the same problem is being foreshadowed here. If the priests do not repent and they do not get their act together, the whole nation will be separated from God. And so here here is where we learn that, that having a fall guy isn't so great after all. Here's where we learn that, that you do not want to take a sigh of relief when you learn that the curse is coming for the priests. When the priest falls, everybody falls. Because he represents the people. When the priest falls, everybody falls. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1 says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and to offer sacrifices for sin. What a terrible thing not to be able to have that. When the priest falls, everybody falls. So what Israel needs in this moment isn't somebody who will take a fall for them. It's somebody who will be able to stand for them. They need a priest not marked with excrement. They need a beautiful priest. A a priest who is not covered in filth, but covered in splendor and righteousness. A priest who is beautiful. And this is always how it was meant to be. You know what's so interesting? Did you know that one of the very first words used to describe the priesthood in all of scriptures, in Exodus chapter 28, in verse 2, when God is instituting this line through Aaron, the first word used to describe the priesthood is the word beauty. It's what we read in Exodus 28. Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Aaron and his sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, and you shall make holy garments, garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. The priests were meant to be beautiful. And the passage goes on to describe those beautiful garments that they would wear made of pure linen, of gold and, and scarlet and blue and purple fabrics. And for the high priest, even more beautiful. The, the outfit was even more glorious. There's gems of, of light that they would wear on their chest, an onyx and uh, on the breastplate and, and an ephod covered in 12 jewels. And all this was to represent the people before God. Those beautiful gemstones represented or stood in for the people. God's creation was always meant to be beautiful and glorious, but our sin has marred that, and so God sends priests to intervene for the people, to make sacrifices for the people, and he would dress them, God dresses them in in such a way, in such a beauty, to show the people that when you put your faith in this priest, and when you put your faith in the sacrifices and the atonement that he makes, this is how God sees you. You're not disgusting in your sin. You're glorious in splendor. This is how God receives you, just as beautiful as these stones and gems. And that's the only way God will receive you. Brothers and sisters, tonight you need to know that the only way that God is going to welcome you into his presence is if you are as beautiful, nay, even more beautiful than those gems that the priests would wear over their chest. And so what do you do? When they're caked with filth and dung. It's a picture of our heart. That's the problem here. Is that this is a picture of our filthy hearts, right? How can we come to God when we are all sin? We need someone else to go for us. Someone to go in our place. And they need to be purer than you. They need to be entirely pure. You need Jesus Christ. You need Jesus, the greatest high priest, the one 
who keeps this priestly covenant that we, we learn of here in Malachi and in places like Exodus and Deuteronomy, the one who does not, does not corrupt the covenant, but the one who keeps the covenant, the one who's even making intercession for us right now, still representing us, and we take hope and, and, and comfort knowing that he's representing us and, and he's, he's wearing something that's even more beautiful than shining gems over his heart because he wears a sinless heart. The beauty of a spotless outfit is far excelled by the beauty of a sinless soul. And this is what Jesus brings to the Father for us. One who not only wears robes of splendor, gold and purple and blue threading, one who wears robes of righteousness, perfection. He is the only one who can truly bless us, and we never need to worry about his personal failures defiling his blessing. He's perfect, and everything he says is perfect, and everything that comes from him is perfect. We need to be dressed in his perfection, and we can be by faith. This is what we sang of earlier. The first hymn tonight, that's inspired by the language of Exodus 28, talking about the garments of the priests, right? Jesus, thy blood and righteousness. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress. Those are the two adjectives used to describe the priestly garments. They had to be glorious and beautiful. And it's Jesus and his blood and his righteousness that, that when we put our faith in, In him we receive them, and they are beautiful, and they are glorious. And the hymn goes on to say, In flaming worlds, in the new world, with these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. We will not hang our heads in in shame. We don't hang our heads in fear before Almighty God because of our sin, because we come in the righteousness of another, of our high priest, of Jesus Christ. We heard this in the call to worship. Since then... We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And here it is. Let us then with confidence, confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace in time of need. When you are as beautiful as the beautiful Son of God, the beautiful High Priest, then you will never hang your head. You will never be afraid. You'll run to God with confidence. No one needs to fall for you because Christ stands in your place, and you will stand too because of our priest. In my study at home, I have um, a poem that hangs on my wall by George Herbert, perhaps the greatest English poet of all time, certainly of the 17th century, um, that a friend of mine calligraphied for, for me as a gift, very beautiful. It's the poem called Aaron. Uh, Herbert, yes, a beautiful poet, but he was also a pastor. He was a priest in the Church of uh, England, Anglican priest. And he wrote Aaron, clearly uh, for himself, but for pastors. It's a poem for pastors, but it has meaning for every Christian. And the poem begins by describing the beauty of Aaron's priestly garb, as, as we heard it described in Exodus 28. This is the first line of the poem. Holiness on the head, light and perfections on the breast, light and perfections referring to the gemstones, harmonious bells below, and the, the garments they would wear with the bells, raising the dead to lead them unto life and rest. Thus are true Aaron's dress. This is what true Aaron's, true priests look like, Herbert says. But then in the following verse comes George Herbert's recognition that as a pastor, as a priest in some respects, he's not dressed like a true Aaron. In fact, he says, profaneness in my head, defects in darkness upon my breast, a noise of passions ringing me for dead unto a place where there is no rest. Poor priest, thus I am dressed. We can all echo that. And so what do we do? We find our hope in Jesus. Only another head I have, another heart and breast, another music making me live. 
and not dead, without whom I could have no rest. In him I am well dressed. Christ is my only head, my alone only heart and breast, my only music striking me even dead, that to the old man I may rest and be in him well dressed. There's your beauty. It's found in Jesus Christ. Aaron, the line of high priests, the faith ones and the unfaith ones, they came before the Holy of Holies with those gemstones over their hearts. Come to God tonight with Christ over your heart, with Christ in your heart, and he will receive you for what you truly are, nothing other than beautiful. Let's pray. Lord, we are not worthy to receive your gracious and merciful gifts that you so freely pour out to us in the gospel. And tonight we have learned of one of the greatest gifts of all, the gift of having a great high priest, one to intercede for us, one to represent us. Lord, with what joy do we thank you for the fact that our priest is perfect. Our priest will not die and be replaced by another. Our priest will not sin and, and bring curse upon us with his own failings and failures. We have Jesus Christ, the priest who ever lives to make intercession for his own. Lord, we want to be found in him. We want him to be found in us, deep in our faith even this evening, to, to grasp a hold of him anew and afresh to make him our only claim and our only plea. Lord, we would be polluted, despised, and defiled without him. But we are glorious and we are beautiful in him. Cause us to see that reality and cause us to seek no other comfort, no other refuge, no other mediator, but the beautiful Son of God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.